Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. And he said, come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb and with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Elise. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, be with us in these next few minutes as we look at your word and um, see this, this, this story that, that is more than just a fable and more than just a historical story, but, but it is the good news that Christ has risen. Father, I pray for those who are listening who might not know you or may be far from you or may be wrestling with the idea of, of Jesus and Christianity and the church. God, I pray that you would soften their hearts and, and give them ears to hear the good news of the gospel, the truth of Jesus. Give them hearts to receive it by faith. Father, be with all of us as, as we see Jesus. If, if, if anything else gets done this morning, I pray that we just, we walk away with a sense of awe and a sense of joy that the victory is ours in Christ. For it's in his name only that we can come to you. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. As I said, I'm, I'm glad you guys are here with us. My name is Michael. I'm one of the pastors. Um, I know it's Easter, but we're going to do what we do every week, uh, which is read scripture, preach the gospel, and celebrate, um, because that's what um, we are called to do, right? Celebrate the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the good news, which answers our great problem, right? Our great problem is that, that we are sinners, um, that we have separated ourselves, we've disobeyed God, we've, 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 we've created this cosmic eternal gap between us and the God of the universe, but he made a way for us back to him to be saved through Jesus Christ. And so we talked about this last week. If you guys were here with us, we, we preached through the second half of Matthew 27, and we talked about how Jesus came and, and he died in our place for our sins, meaning he cleansed us from the bad things we do, but he also made us right in God's eyes and restored that relationship that was broken, right? And then after he died, he was like, most people put in a tomb. He was put in a tomb. But they wanted to make sure he didn't arise. And so they guarded it with, with probably very strong, burly men, some soldiers. And they sealed it with the emperor's seal to make sure that he would not get out. And so here we are on the third day, right? 
I said, if you read the last verse of Matthew 27, the last two verses or so, where Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers, go make it as secure as you can. They went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. And I said, you guys are going to see how well that worked this week. This is where we are on the third day. And, and, and this is so important because Jesus said, I'm going to die, I'm going to rise, right? This is so important because if he doesn't rise from the dead, his, his death means nothing. It has no power, absolutely no power, right? Because he would just be another victim of death. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, he would just be another victim of death and we would be hopeless. So for his death to do anything, in the grand scheme of things, or to me or you, he had to rise, right? He had to rise. For his death to have power, he, he has to have power over death, right? For us, for us to have hope past death, Christ has to have power over death. And so this is why for us who have faith in him, this is so significant. This is why it's one of our two staple holidays. Because he is risen and it matters to us right? And, and when I say that, I'm like, we've hope in it. It means something to us. This is more than like, death wasn't the end of Jesus' story, so it's not the end of yours. Like, yes, that's true, but there's so much more weight. There's so much more gravity because when Jesus rose from the dead, what he did was he accomplished something for us, right? He accomplished life. Life, like life after death, he accomplished for us. He secured it. He guaranteed it. And when I say he, he accomplished life, that means he gives us life. And, and the two ways you can kind of think about it is life anew and life forever. Life anew, that's what we're living right now, right? We're, 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 the Spirit has, has given life to us and now I am living, right? It's no longer I, but Christ who lives in me. And so I'm being sanctified. I'm being made like Jesus. So throughout this journey from when I was saved at the age of six until the Lord returns or brings me home by death, I am being made like Jesus, living in the Spirit. That's life anew. I have new life. But also, there's life forever, which means when I die, I have life forever. Death is, is just the means to get to the end. It's the means to get me to heaven, where everything's perfect, everything's holy, everything's spotless. And better than all of that, I love that I'm going to see some old friends, see some family members I, I was too young to meet. But more than anything, I get to be with Jesus, right? Like, like that's life forever, is being with him forever. And so we have life anew and life eternal. But we can't celebrate and we can't worship a crucified Jesus unless there's a resurrected Jesus, Right? We can't sell it. So the gospel is more than just, the words I used last week were propitiation and expiation, right? It's more than just like our sins have been dealt with, right? The gospel is much more than that. We, please don't reduce the gospel down to just Jesus died for you. There's so much more than that. There's so much more. The gospel is good news, yes, that we've been saved from something, sin, death, hell, Satan, but also that we've been saved to something. We've been saved to Christ. We've been saved to life. We've been saved to eternity. And so if you're hearing about Jesus, maybe for the first time, maybe for the hundredth time, maybe you've heard about him before, I, I, I don't know, but, but if, if you go, okay, I, I feel unworthy to come. I'm here on Easter because that's, that's what I have to do. That's what people do in Texas. I'm here. I'm at church. And you go, but, but I feel unworthy. Don't. Like, don't, don't let that be a discouragement to you. In fact, if you feel unworthy, I would say you should feel encouraged. Why should you feel encouraged? Because that's, that's the Spirit working in you to convict you of your sin, meaning to bring you to a place of repentance where you say, I no longer want to live this life. There's something better in Jesus. That's what's happening in you. So feel encouraged, right? That's, that's exactly why Jesus came to earth, to deal with your sin. And so if your sin makes you feel uncomfortable, you go, I don't want to talk about it. I'm like, great. It was nailed to the cross. It was nailed to the cross and it was crucified, right? Jesus, he was perfect in every way you weren't. And so right there I go, well, I can't stack up. I can't. 
you can't. But then he, he died in our place as the perfect sacrifice for our sins, meaning he paid the penalty so I don't have to. He paid the penalty so you don't have to. And then he rose from the dead, which not only defeated sin, but also death. And so the good news of the gospel is if you repent of your sins and believe in him, you'll have life, life anew and life eternal. And so no matter who you are, whether you've never heard the gospel before or me who's, who's preaching it, right, the gospel's for us. It's for us. If we've sinned once, we're eligible, right? We don't need to get on a waiting list. There, there's, there's no one or no sin that is outside of the reach of God's grace. There just, there isn't. And how do I know this? I'm, I'm getting to the text. Who does Jesus go to when he rises? Does he go to the most powerful people in the world? No. Does he go to the religious leaders of the day? No. He goes to what would have been less prominent members of society in those days. He goes to women. He goes to two women. Two women that, that have walked with him and have loved him. And he's loved and Jesus is making a point in this, right? He, he doesn't run into the synagogue. He doesn't run to, to Pilate's house going, look, I told you I'd rise from the dead. Here I am. That's not what he does. He walks up to these two women who know him, who are probably grieving and going, I can't believe three days ago he died. Our king, the, the promised sovereign king, came, did all of these things and then died, and they're probably grieving and Jesus walks out in like the most human way possible and just says, greetings. He just says, greetings. Which, which I love because that's just like the most human, common, cheerful expression you could think of. He just says, greetings. And notice, he's not floating around like a ghost. How do I know this? Look at verse nine. When they worshiped him, they took hold of his feet. Now, I don't know. I'm not gonna ascribe to all the movies out there, but, but movies, right? If you ever look at a ghost, they rarely ever have feet. And if they do, and you try to grab them, your hand will go right through it, right? And so this is a, a human man with skin, with flesh, with bones, with blood coursing through his veins that they grab, and they grab hold of it. And, and I, I love this picture because it shows us that Jesus is fully man in that he had feet and they grabbed his feet, but also fully God because they went down before him, they bowed before him and they worshiped him. And so here we go, fully God, fully man, risen in the flesh. And I, I think it's amazing, right? If, if you look at Matthew's gospel as we have over the last, what, 63 sermons, we saw in chapter two, the magi came and bowed before Jesus and here at the end of the book, we see women and disciples bowing before Jesus. Jesus' story starts and ends with being worshiped. So our, our two biggest holidays, th this isn't just some angel coming down or some ghost. I mean, our two biggest holidays are as tangible as skin, right? It's, it's a baby in a manger and a risen savior with feet, all right? This is a, a, a real man and I say all that to say he really rose, like he was really alive. He was truly living. Matthew's not just crafting this beautiful story with these poetic book endings of like, well, it started with worship, it ended with worship. It started with a man, it ended with a man. Sure, he's doing that, but he's also giving us a historical account of what's happening a historical account. Because here's why. He, he leaves in, if you read verse 11 to 15, I'm like, why did Matthew put that in there? That does not seem like a text to preach on Easter Sunday. That, 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 that makes no sense to me. But the reason it's there is because people who didn't want Jesus to rise from the dead, well, they had to deal with the fact that he rose from the dead. The people that didn't want him to rise Right? So, so what happened is Jesus died on Friday and then on Sunday he rose from the dead and then the chief priests who had spent, I don't know, the last three years trying to kill this guy, they go, well, that didn't work. We need to go make a new plan. And so they run back, right? The guard says to the chief priests, okay, he's alive. He's not in there. I saw him walking around. We need to do something. So what do they do? Well, they, they launch a massive PR campaign, right? They do. They, they, they start to spin their own narrative of what's going to happen, 
And, and they start, they literally pool money. Re, that's what it says. They, they take counsel, they have sufficient sum of money, and they pay off these soldiers saying, this is what you need to go tell the press. So they spin this PR campaign to try to say, well, Jesus isn't actually risen. The disciples stole the body. The disciples stole the body, which is embarrassing to these soldiers, right? Because there's this massive, it's not like they, they couldn't stop these guys who are, I don't know, they're fishers and carpenters. It's not other soldiers. So you have these 11 normal dudes coming to the tomb and the soldiers can't stop them. And so somehow they, they take out this guard of soldiers and then remove this stone and cart off Jesus and no one saw it. That doesn't make sense. That's embarrassing to the soldiers, but that's the best that they could think of. And then it's also embarrassing to the religious leaders because this was their plan for three years to kill this man and to make sure he was dead. That's why they sealed it. That's why they guarded it. They even, st when he was on the cross, they even stabbed him in the side to make sure he was dead. And so they're completely embarrassed. And they were like, okay, if, if this gets back up to Pilate, our governor, uh, we'll take care of it, all right? We'll go to his house. We'll kind of talk him down, say, look, that didn't really happen. So, so they, they have this idea that, that they can contain this. And, and Matthew puts this in the story. And he says, guys, this story's going around and it's being spread to Jews today. When Matthew wrote this, Decades after this happened, he said they're still trying to perpetuate this narrative. They're still trying to tell people this. They're trying to still spin this story. And Matthew puts this here to show us that the resurrection wasn't staged. It, was, it couldn't have been. Because if Jesus hadn't been raised from the dead, then these people wouldn't spend all this time, all this money, all these efforts to try to control the narrative. They wouldn't. They would just say, look, here's the dead body. He's dead. That's all they'd have to do. And so the resurrection isn't some bogus fairy tale that's fabricated on myths. And, and there's been a lot of historical data that's confirmed and validated the, the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus. Other religions even attest to Jesus being a man who walked and ate and slept and did amazing things, taught great things and even died. But when we come to the resurrection, a lot of non-Christian thinkers try to explain this away. And honestly, all of the answers and all of the solutions that they come up with, they don't hold water. They can't, right? They'll say, oh, well, Jesus didn't die on the cross. Or, I don't know, his, his disciples came. His tomb wasn't empty. Or maybe like all of the disciples were just hallucinating because they were so sad when Jesus, when they said Jesus showed up to them. But, but all of these ideas, all of these claims, all of these narratives that have tried to craft and, and revise history, they've all been debunked by eyewitness account. That's why I read at the beginning of this service that Paul starts naming in 1 Corinthians 5. Well, he went to Peter. You don't believe him? Go ask Peter. He went to this guy. He went to that guy. And he starts naming people by names. And he says, oh, and then he showed up to like 500 people. Right, so the word's out. And he says, this really happened. It's very well documented, not just from a biblical account, but also historical evidence. And so if this was all a hoax, I'm, I'm like, it would have been debunked a long time ago. It should have been debunked a long time ago. And plus, if it was all fake, I mean, we know what happened to the rest of the disciples. They, they would not have died if they knew that this wasn't true. I mean, think about it, right? Out of the 11 disciples and the Matthias who, who, who took Judas's place, of the 12 disciples, all but one of them, there, there was one that died of natural death, John, but still he was tortured and then exiled. But the other 11 were stoned, stabbed, even crucified. Some traditions say that some of the disciples were crucified upside down, brutally murdered. Even Matthias, the, the backup to Judas, he comes in and he was burned to death. He was burned to death. Why? Because they knew this was the truth. They knew it was the truth. Because if it was all a conspiracy, you'd think at least one of them would go, okay, actually, it didn't happen. Can I not die? Right? That one of them would have had to do that. 
One of them, but, but they didn't because they knew what happened. They knew that Jesus died. They knew Jesus rose from the dead. They knew that he defeated sin, that he defeated death, that he defeated hell, that he defeated Satan. And they knew that when Jesus accomplished salvation for the world, they knew they had to tell people. They knew they had to. And they said, I'm going to take this as far as I can, as long as I'm alive. And if you kill me, I'm going to do it until I'm dead. And so they gave their lives so that other people's lives might be saved. They, they, they carried on what Jesus was doing. And so all this to say, guys, he really died and he really rose. He really rose. And when I say that, that means that he's victorious over death. And not just like symbolically victorious in like he showed us something really cool like a great magic trick or something. Jesus holds the keys to death. He holds the keys to hell. He owns it. He owns it. And that's why when he shows up to the disciples in verse 16, and he goes and and they worship him, what does he start with? What's the first thing he says? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, typically, when we say, all right, we're going to get to the Great Commission. We all like to start in verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples. But that doesn't make sense even grammatically to do because go therefore, well, what is therefore? Go therefore and make disciples. That's like me saying, go because of what just happened and make disciples. And you're probably going, well, what just happened? Well, Jesus just said it. All authority had been given to me. All authority had been given to me. And so we can't divorce that, that statement from the rest of the Great Commission and what we're supposed to do, right? In fact, verse 18 is not only the link between the resurrection and the Great Commission, but it's the very reason that we go, therefore, and make disciples. Because we go because Jesus has authority. We go because he has authority. All author- and by all authority, everything. Jesus has authority over everything, which means there's not a single thing Jesus doesn't have authority over. Not a single thing. He has authority over his life. He said this in the Gospel of John. He said, no one takes my life. I lay it down willingly. And you know what? I can lay it down and pick it back up again. And he did that. And he showed that, right? He laid his life down on Good Friday and picked it back up on Easter Sunday. He has authority over death. We're going to read this later in the service, but in 1 Corinthians 15, after Paul's talking all about the resurrection, he gets to the end and he just goes, death, where's your victory? Death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God through through Jesus Christ who gives us victory. So Jesus is authoritative over everything. Nations, nature, disease, demons, sin, death, our lives, every life. We've seen this all throughout the Gospel of Matthew. We've seen him speak to waves and they obey. We've we've seen him do amazing things. And so when he transitions to the Great Commission to tell us what to do, we have to have the idea of Jesus' authority in our minds. And so what I'm going to do in our last, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes or so, is is we're going to look at the Great Commission and go, okay, Jesus accomplished all of this. He has all of the authority. And then he says, therefore, do this. Therefore, go. And so we have to think, okay, since he has given us this commission and he has all authority, what do we do? And so let's break this down into four points. So the first one is we share the word. This is the first half of verse 19. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. So we share the word, which means we live our lives according to the gospel, right? And then we speak the gospel. We tell other people about the gospel in word and in deed, we show Jesus. We point people to Jesus. But notice it says go, so that's an active movement forward, right? It's not sit and make disciples, it's go. And I know some of you guys who have maybe taken Greek, you can try to debate me on whether the verb means go or as you go. But even if you win that debate, he says, make disciples of all nations. So you got to go. And so I, I don't want us to exegete ourselves to an excuse to get out of sharing the gospel, right? Because if, if you really look, if, if you want to do exegesis, I'll do that with you. Let's go. It says, 
all nations. That's, that's the Greek phrase, panta ta ethne, which, which doesn't just mean a bunch of nations and a bunch of countries. That means every tribe, every family, every clan, every people. You guys maybe have heard the term today, people groups, right? We've, we've heard of those people groups. There are 11,000 people groups today in the world. 11,000 people groups. And guess how many of them have the gospel? 5,000 of them. Which means 2,000 years later, here we are, and Jesus is saying, your job is to go and bring the gospel to those remaining 6,000 people groups. That's what you're supposed to do. Why? Because I have all authority. So this, this isn't some general command to just make a bunch of Christians or a bunch of disciples or build massive churches. This is not, it's not a general command. It's a specific command to make disciples amongst every group of people in the world. Every group, right? This isn't some comfortable call to just the most Christian people out there. Jesus didn't say, come, sit, be baptized, and let me make you a disciple. He says, go, baptize, make disciples of all nations. This is a costly call for every Christian to go to the ends of the earth. And, and what happens is when we start to do that, when we start to bring the gospel to people groups that are different than our own, we literally start to get a picture of what heaven's going to be like. Where every tribe, every tongue, every nation, old, young, black, white, tall, short, you name it, all gathered around the throne of God, worshiping Jesus together in unity. So when we go out on mission and we evangelize and we see the Lord do a work in saving people, we, we get a foretaste of heaven. I mean, seriously, look around. We don't all look the same. We don't. And that's good. That's what heaven's going to be like. If you want heaven to be like a bunch of you, you're not going to like it. That's what heaven's going to be like. And while I'm here, let me say one more thing. This isn't just for the gifted evangelists in the room, okay? I know that there's a gift of evangelism. I get that. It's a different conversation for a different day, but, but Jesus gives his disciples, right, at the beginning. When Jesus' ministry starts in Matthew chapter four, what does he say? He says, all of my followers will be fishers of men. And then, so that's at the beginning of his ministry. Here we are at the end of his earthly ministry, and he says, all of my disciples are going to be disciple makers. All of you. You're all called to make disciples. And that's why Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher from 200 or so years ago, said every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. And so we must go. We must go. So we need to share the word. But also, point number two, and this is the second half of verse 19, is that we show the word. We show the word. We show the word. So we go, therefore, make disciples of all nations. How? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We show the word by baptism, right? After we're saved, we, we symbolically go down in water and are raised back up out of the water. This is how we respond to the gospel, right? We repent, we believe, and we're baptized. You read Acts, that's what happens over and over and over and over and over again. Every time there's a baptism, it's because someone believed, all right, so we repent, we believe, we're baptized. And it shows other people in the church and outside of the church what Jesus did in us and for us. And so when we believe, we're baptized. We're baptized into a local church. So this, this baptism, it, it symbolizes identifying with the death and resurrection of Jesus, but also with the body of Jesus, with the church. So that's why we baptize people into the church. So we make disciples of all nations, we baptize them, and then, that's not all, Jesus goes on, in verse 20, he says, teach the word. We teach the word. So we not only share the word, we not only show the word, but we teach the word. We teach the word. He says, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. So notice, we're not just supposed to receive, we're supposed to respond to the word, right? In baptism, and in this response is a reciprocation of the word, a, a, you, have to, you have to see the progression here, right? We receive the word by faith. We respond to the word by baptism. And then we reciprocate the word by teaching other people. 
And so we're supposed to study, we're supposed to teach God's word for this is how we grow. This is why I'm like, if you don't own a Bible, take the ones underneath the chairs, it's yours. It's yours. That's why we're a word-centered church. We're gonna read a lot of scripture. We're gonna sing songs that come from a lot of scripture. Even our communion liturgy is scripture. Because I'm like, if I'm gonna put words into your mouth to say back to me, it's going to be God's word. So we're going to be a word-centered church. And so hopefully, if you come and you like this church, hopefully you like it because everything here is just dripping with God's word. That's, that's my job as a pastor to do, is to minister the word to you, not minister my ideas or agendas. It's to give you the word. And, so, and I don't really have that much more to offer I don't have a big Instagram following. I don't have smoke machines or cool lasers or anything. I don't, we don't have the glitz and glamour. We just got the word. But what we're going to attract you with is what we're going to keep you with, right? So we have the word. I don't want us to get lost in all the sauce. Just meat, all right? Meat. Meat. That's what God's commanded us to do. And that's how we mature one another, right? By the word. And so notice this, we make disciples by the word and we mature disciples by the word. That's why I said it last week and I'll say it again. I don't have two separate gospel tracks for young believers and non-believers and one for mature Christians. I got the Bible. I got the gospel. And it's for everyone. It's for everyone. So that's what we're called to do. We're called to share, called to show, and we're called to teach. And then Jesus leaves us with a promise. And this is, I, I love this. And we can't forget this. We can't forget this. He says, behold, I am with you always to the end of the earth. So this is point number four. We have the word. John says that in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus, the word of God. The true word of God is with us always. Notice, notice the weight of this, right? Jesus didn't just die for the sins of the world and then defeat death and hell and Satan and sin, but he says, on top of all of that, as you go, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you. When Jesus was walking with the disciples, he said, I'm going to die, I'm going to rise, and I'm going to go to heaven. And the disciples were like, no, 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 we love having you here. And Jesus says, the one coming after me is greater. He said, I'm going to give you the spirit. It's better that I go. It's better that I go so that you can go forth to the ends of the earth. And so our commission, it doesn't just have power in it because Jesus has all authority and because he died and conquered death. It's true. He did that. But it has we have authority as we go because the one who has all authority is with us. It makes sense. I'm, I'm, not, just, I'm not just bringing a, a letter that somebody can vouch for me. He's here with me. He's working in me and through me. And so I'm, I'm not, when, when I say we go, right, we go as evangelists, we go as people who share the gospel, we're not going out to try to fight for victory, right? Right? We are standing in the victory. You catch that? We're, we're, not, we're not going out and fighting for victory. Jesus already did that. We already talked about that. Jesus did that for us. We stand in the victory that he's defeated our sin and that death has lost its sting. And so we go. We go. We're, we're all evangelists. We're all evangelists. Now, that word evangelist, it comes from the Greek word, which is evangelion. Evangelion. Now, this word, literally, when, you, when, when, when evangelion is used in the Bible, you see it translated in English as gospel or good news. Evangelion, gospel or good news. What would happen was, in ancient Greek culture, when, when a, a tribe or a nation would go off to war, and they would win the war, they would send back a messenger to report, hey, we won. That was the evangelist. And what he would do is he would get back to the town and he would run through the streets yelling the evangelion, the good news. We've won the battle. It's done. The victory's ours. And everyone would come out into the streets and they'd all start celebrating. That's what we do with the gospel, right? That's what we do with 
the gospel. That's what that word means. Now, let me, for those of you guys that don't like history, let me give you a sports analogy, all right? I love sports. I love basketball. March Madness is like, that's my month, right? Um, And Baylor's great this year, right? I don't know if you guys know, but we won yesterday. We play tomorrow in the national championship. And if we win, and I know that's that's a really big if because I've been a Baylor fan. I've been disappointed before, right? So it's a big if, but if we win, I know what's going to happen, right? I know that if, if you drive up 35 and make it through all that construction and you look over and you see campus tomorrow night, if, if we win, it will be lit up. It's going to be loud. People are going to be running around Fountain Mall in and up all of the streets surrounding Baylor yelling to one another, we've won. And if you're sleeping, I'm going to wake you up and invite you into the celebration because we won, right? And, and all of these people running around, they're all evangelists. They're all evangelists for Baylor. They didn't go through some Baylor apologetics class or some evangelist training, right? People talk about and they celebrate what they love. And they love Baylor. And Baylor won. And so they're going to celebrate out of the overflow of their heart that their team won. Now here's what's funny. Those people running around campus tomorrow, they didn't win the game. They didn't win the game. They weren't even there. Like the game's being played in Indianapolis. They weren't even at the game. But because they had chosen to identify themselves with the victor, they get to celebrate a victory that they had nothing to do with. And they're going to put on their Baylor gear like I will and run around. Well, my girls will be sleeping, so I'll be quiet yelling, right? And it's not my name on the jersey. It's not my name on the front or on the back. But I'm celebrating a victory And I still get to receive the joy of victory. I get to partake in the joy of victory and invite people in to that celebration. And when you drive by Baylor, what you'll see is a bunch of people, young and old, that look nothing alike, all unified around one thing, celebrating one thing, that the victory is theirs. Now, my hope's not in Baylor, right? I mean, I would love if we won. That'd be great. But my hope is in Christ, who had the greatest victory ever over, not not over Gonzaga, over death, over sin, over hell, over Satan, over everything that, that binds us to the pains of this world, he defeated. He defeated that. And so as Christians, I'm like, we have the greatest victory. We need to be the loudest partiers on the face of the earth. Because we have the greatest victory. We have the greatest news in the world. And and once your heart starts to move and go, yeah, that is the best thing that could have ever done and I get to receive in this and knowing the one with all authority is with me, I'm gonna tell everyone about it. Everyone. And so look, I'm I'm not trying to guilt you into evangelism or sign you up for some program. We don't don't do a ton of programs here, right? Right? I'm, I'm, I'm simply trying to invite you to come with me, run through our streets, run into our neighborhoods, run into our workplaces and kids, into our schools, and tell people just, we've won. The victory's ours. Come celebrate with me, and we'll invite people in to that celebration. And so today, tomorrow, and forever, I want to invite you into that celebration because the victory is Christ, and it can be yours if you're in him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let me pray for us this morning.